That's it. So now it's recording. So you just hold it and I'll introduce the speaker and then I'll take it off. Okay. Okay, good morning everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's an exciting day. I'm really just thrilled to be here and introduce our now, most profound, actually, guest speaker today. Thank you very much, Dr. McClough. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Dr. McClough say a few words. I've met Dr. McAbee about 10 years ago at, at one of the uh, conferences in Philadelphia where Ras Akov in his last speeches organized the town hall conference to discuss uh, societal issues. Uh, Dr. McAbee is one of the most famous theorists on leadership. He has published numerous books. He's devoted his entire uh, career uh, to service of leadership. Uh, he is the lecturer at Oxford. He's, uh, he lectures at Harvard. He now comes to UDC. And let's give it a hand. He's a scholar contributor to Washington Post. Uh, he's been named, he's got, received the title of a Sir in Europe, so he's not just Dr. Michael Maccabee, he's a Sir Dr. Michael Maccabee. I just found out his, I sent you all of the books that he's published, well, it's not enough, he's working on two new books, one is coming out in spring, he just, uh, he's starting up another one uh, very shortly. Uh, he's done, he's worked with most uh, academic institutions. He is consulted with the largest companies in the world today. It was military, it was government, there was anything. Is there anything that you haven't done, Dr. McAvey? <laughs> well, I haven't started talking. <laughs> uh, so I'm really, he spoke at Google, he's an invited speaker at every major corporation. So with that, uh, and uh, we're really happy to have him here, especially in our brand new School of Business here, the School of Business of Public Administration, in this brand new building. Last time Dr. Maccabee came, uh, we allocated a small closet which we couldn't open, and as, as you know. Now we're actually having here in one of the, I think, best equipped School of Businesses in, in the Washington DC area. And with that, I'll give Dr. Maclouf just a few words to, to say. Uh, Dr. McClough is the chairman of the uh, Department of Management at our school. Well, uh, good morning, class. Um, good morning. I would uh, like to welcome Dr. McAbee on behalf of the uh, Dean of the School of Business and Public Administration. It's indeed an honor to have you with us here today, uh, Dr. McAbee. It's not the first time, I think. Uh, is it the second time? Or first time? Second time. Uh, we're really honored to have you and would like to have you again and again and again. Um, uh, we just moved into this building, brand new building. I hope we'll have a chance to look at it uh, from this floor up. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, having you again. And uh, we benefit greatly from your uh, lecture uh, the previous time. I personally took a lot of notes and I'm using my notes uh, until today. So uh, uh, welcome and uh, we're very, very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, first of all, congratulations for this building. Nice room. And, uh, well, I think we should all congratulate ourselves on the election. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, what it means for the leadership of this country. Um, we can see, I mean, one thing we can see from this whole election, how much the country is changing in terms of its demographics and, uh, and the fact that uh, we are really seeing a struggle about whether we're going to be moving into a new century and the new way of looking at things or whether we're going back and I think the lesson is from my point of view a very positive statement. So I'm going to, uh, I'd like to talk today, to you. I know some of you have read my book on narcissistic leaders and uh, many of you took questionnaires uh, that come out of that book and so I want to put that in context and give you a sense of who you are. I mean, have a sense now of what you're like. Um, and it's very varied. You're very varied in terms of your attitudes and approaches in the 
they're one of the most varied group I've seen in a long time in terms of, uh, of uh, personality differences. So I don't know how much you're aware of that uh, <laughs> with each other. So uh, you have very different ways of, of, of viewing things. I mean, some of you view things very much in the sense of what does this mean in terms of helping people? And others of you do things in terms of what does this mean in practical terms and in terms of how we're going to really be effective in what we're doing. Very different. And some of you view it in terms of how can we create something new and better? How can, we, how can I be an entrepreneur? So uh, those are real differences. In, and uh, in my experience, the more we understand each other, the more we can see that we can complement each other in terms of projects and working together. So I'm going to go back and just kind of review the whole question of what is leadership? <coughs> how, do we, how should we understand it? There are a lot of definitions of leadership. You can look at books you can find. I know somebody wrote a book with a hundred different definitions of leadership. However, I think there's a very simple definition. It's the only one I think holds. And that is, a leader is someone people follow. The leader is someone who follows. The reason I say that is, if, you, if people are following you, you're a leader, right? Mm -hmm. And if nobody's following you, I don't care what you call yourself. You're not a leader. <laughs> So all these definitions that people say a leader bring, raises people's levels, or a leader uh, has a vision. I mean, there are people with visions in mental hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so does that make sense to you? A leader is someone with followers. So really, the interesting question is not the definition. The interesting question is, why is anyone following you? <laughs> Two, how are they following? I mean, why in terms, some people will follow a leader out of fear. You know, in a business. If you don't do this, you're going to get fired. So they follow the leader. Sometimes what we would like, if we're leaders in business, we'd like people to follow us because they believe in what we're doing, that it's a good thing. And that it's, uh, it, it makes sense. The re Reasons make sense. It's very different. So first question is why. Second question is how. How are people following? Are they following you kind of passively, waiting for you to give instructions? Or are they following you because they've internalized the values, the purpose, and they're even contributing to it. They're trying to make it better. They're trying to help it succeed. Those are two very different ways of following, right? So I think we should start there. That leadership is a relationship. Very different from management. Management has to do with processes, functions. You don't have to relate to anybody to do the planning, hiring, measuring. These things can even be done by teams, and they are in many places. Uh, GE has a number of factories, one in North Carolina making all the engines for the uh, Boeing 777. They only have one manager in the whole plant, and she's met, her main job is, is marketing with Boeing. Everything else is done by teams. So management, management can be done in many different ways, but it's not a relationship. So now, why do we need leaders? Why can't everything just be managed? Because you need direction. Hmm? Because you need direction. Yeah. Because you need direction. Well, you need direction. Maybe you could publish a, a book of directions. <laughs> So why do you need leaders? 
to change the way things are done? Hmm? Change. change the way you can't are. change anything without leaders. You can never change an organization without leaders. How's it going to change? You can't create trust without leaders. You can't get people enthusiastic without leaders. Why do you think coaches and winning coaches in professional sports make so much money? Look at the difference between those who have succeeded over time and those who haven't. What is it about them? What is it about great coaches? Yeah. yeah. The inspiration? Hmm? The inspiration that they, they inspire people? <coughs> Did you hear that? My hair is not so good. So. I say, is it the, uh, the inspiration? Yeah. Inspiration? They, uh, they know their players. They know them individually. Yeah, relations. Hmm? Create relations between them. They have, it's a relationship. Leadership is a relationship. You know, I wrote in the book, what's the name, who was the, the coach of the Lakers and the Bulls? Um, Phil Jackson. Hmm? Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson. What? Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson. How, how could he win? Everyone said, oh, well, he won with Michael Jordan. Then he goes to the Lakers, he wins again. And he wrote about it, it's in the, my book, how he knew each one of the players. They did, Kobe Bryant didn't get along with uh, Shaquille, so he got them both reading books, the right books, and getting them together, and so on. I mean, that's leadership. And you don't see that with every coach that kind of relationship, that kind of knowledge. I mean, I call that personality intelligence. And part of it is, comes from the kind of understanding that we did, the questionnaire I gave you, and I'll go into that. That's part of it. That's the conceptual part. But no amount of conceptual part is going to tell me whether you're frightened, whether you're happy, whether you're angry, that's, a, that's the heart, not the head. You've got to be able to experience that. And just the way there is a discipline to developing concepts, knowledge, that's a discipline for developing the heart also. I'm going to say something about that. I mean, if you go, it's a kind of knowledge that you find in every great philosophical tradition that was lost in modern times. You go back to the Bible, the story of King Solomon. King Solomon has a dream. And God comes to him in the dream and says, what, what can I give you? And Solomon says, a heart that listens. And that's the basis of wisdom. He doesn't say money, power, it's the heart that listens. In the uh, uh, Confucian tradition, they talk about the fact that you can't, as a leader, you're not going to develop the state unless you first develop the city. You're not going to develop the city unless you develop the family. And you're not going to develop the family unless you develop your heart. It's in every great tradition. Ibn Khaldun, great Muslim 14th century thinker from Morocco, he wrote, he quoted the Quran, God gave you eyes to see, ears, ears to hear, and a heart to think, and you're a little grateful. <coughs> he talked about how you, that the head, he said the head is fine for mathematics, crafts, so on, but no amount of the head is going to tell you whether something is true or good or beautiful. It's a matter of developing the heart. So, uh, to put one thing, does this make sense to you so far? Yeah. <laughs> that if you're going to be a lead, real leader, leadership's a relationship. You want to have followers who are enthusiastic, who are inspired, who want to follow you. And to do that, you've got to understand them, know them. And that takes personality and intelligence. And that's what nobody teaches, business schools. They don't teach you. <coughs> 
and yet it's crucial. Why don't they teach it? Tell me, Sergey. Why don't they teach it? <laughs> oh boy, now I'm on the spot. <laughs> because why, why don't we teach it, guys? Because it's not a, yeah, it's not a science. I mean, trying to learn somebody's personality or that emotional intelligence is not something that is. So it's more of an art than a science. Yeah, it's true. It's an art. It's true. It's an art. And great artists, you know, the great artists are able to describe people. Shakespeare, uh, Dante, Balzac. They're able to describe people deeply. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. And you know, we even use, we use the concepts we get from great art to describe people. So um, if I say to somebody, she's a Lady Macbeth, you know just what I'm saying. Or I say, he's a Hamlet, right? What am I saying? If I say, he's a Hamlet, what am I saying? He's an artist. Hmm? He's an artist. Well, you don't, people aren't she reading Hamlet. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hamlet can't make up his mind. So. And what about Lady Macbeth? You know what that means if I say she's a Lady Macbeth? No. Like ruthless? Hmm? Ruthless. Ruthless. You know, out for power. Now, these were kinds of people in the past who read Shakespeare and so on, they immediately knew that. I said, he's an Iago. Iago was a betrayer, a, a, a nasty snake. So we don't have that. So even though there's an art, all art has science. All art has an art. <coughs> and we can begin to develop our ability conceptually and emotionally. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying it's crucial to be the best kind of leader. Would you agree with me? That's yes. crucial yes. to that, that somebody like a Phil Jackson has that ability? Mm -hmm. So uh, so first of all we've we've defined leadership. Second of all the point needs to be made <coughs> that leadership depends on context. Very important point. Somebody can be the ideal leader in one context and not in another. It's not, it's not just one size fits all. So I, for example, you all, you've all heard of Winston Churchill. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Winston Churchill was the indispensable leader of Great Britain in World War II. Everyone would agree. Inspired <coughs> Britain, kept them going when they were close to defeat. He was rejected by the British public before and after World War II. Same man, same qualities, same abilities. Why? Because <coughs> The people before the war wanted a leader who would give them peace, and Churchill said, Hitler is arming, we must arm, we must prepare for war. They called him a warmonger, and they rejected him. After the war, Churchill was an empire builder, he wanted to keep India, he wanted to keep the British Empire, British public war, wanted to become socialistic wanted a more equitable, fair society, rejected church. So context. Context is crucial. And context has to do with two things. <clears throat> One are the particular challenges. Particular challenges you have. So uh, if you were running a government bureaucracy, <coughs> the challenges are different than if you're leading a professional basketball team or an entrepreneur <coughs> or trying to create collaboration with people or change. 
So one is, what are the challenges? Second are, what are the values of the people you're meeting? What do they want? So, make sense here? So those are the two things that determine the context. Now, if we look today at leadership, I mean, you, you could see, I mean, the second point, what do people want? The whole political uh, election we saw has to do with really people are choosing somebody from the point of view of both. One, what are they, how do they think he's going to react to the challenges we face? And two, how well is he going to further our values? Right? So, uh, now, if we put this in a context, today we're going through a historic change. And I'm going to now focus on business. We're going through a historic change in the nature of work and the nature of people's values and attitudes, both. And let me explain. The, uh, one of the things that uh, Karl Marx described <coughs> is the whole concept of the mode of production and how much it creates the values in a society. And he talked about the difference between the mode of production. And by mode of production, he didn't just mean how you work. He meant the whole value system, culture, that goes around at certain kinds of work and organizations. So he talked about the shift from the feudal world to the capitalist world and how that changed attitudes, values, and so on. And we could have a whole course on that. But today, we're going through a change in the mode of production from a mode of production that has been basically a bureaucratic system, industrial system, like Ford, Henry Ford created, of produ mass producing products as the main value creating mode of production in society. We've gone from that and we're now moving into <coughs> a mode of production which is knowledge and service work. So the most advanced organizations that are creating the most value are not just producing products. They are using knowledge to produce solutions. So IBM in the past was producing computers, mainframes. Today they're going to government or business and saying, how can we use our knowledge and products to make you more productive? I worked with an electrical engineering company that had been making power transformers and relays and things. Customers said, big customers, big metal and mining companies, we don't want to buy a power transformer. We want to buy cleaner, cheaper energy. Now, to do that changes the whole nature of organization, work, leadership. In a bureaucratic industrial world, you can put people in the autonomous roles, coordinate and control, measure work. When I have to produce cheaper, cleaner energy, I've got to work collaboratively, not only with the customer and understand them and their business, I've got to work collaboratively with, within my own organization. I can't just have different business units with profits and loss responsibility. I've got to get people collaborating across different business units and disciplines Work, working together. IBM has to get people software, hardware together with the consultants from Pricewaterhouse that they bought who understand the person's business and what they need and so on. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Now that requires a very different kind of leadership. For example, it, not just one kind of leadership, it requires three times, three types of leadership. All of whom have to work together interactively. On the, on the top, you need strategic leaders, people who can have a vision of where we're going, understanding the threats, the opportunities, the future. On the operational level, you need operational managers who create the processes, who work with the, with the strategists to make sure that the right processes are there, that people are doing the work right together, so on. And on the right on the front line level, you need <coughs> network leaders. You need people who are able to bring people together, who create trust. They don't even have to have an official title. They don't have to have a medical. Management title, it's better if they don't. Now that's not only true of IBM, it's true of the best healthcare organization. But the Mayo Clinic, Kaiser Permanente, all moving in this direction. Collaborative work together with the customer. Because, take a look at healthcare. A bureaucracy, a healthcare bureaucracy can <coughs> produce care. I can produce care, medicines, um, surgery, so on. But it cannot produce health. The only way to produce health is if I get the patient collaborating with the provider together. If the diabetic patient is unwilling to change diet, exercise, and so on, no doctor can create health. Is that clear? So we're going at a huge change here. It's a huge shift from the Ford world, the industrial bureaucratic world, which is still there in some ways. Unfortunately, in the government, we're still back there, where we should be in the knowledge world. We, government should be helping people succeed not just giving out regulations and <coughs> products. <clears throat> the second change is in the nature of how people are growing up, developing values, and so on. If you go back to when I was born, about 80% of American families had a single male wage earner with the mother at home with the family. Today, there are actually more families headed by a single woman than there are those kind of <coughs> And the median family have two career, two jobs. How many people in this room were, bo were born in a family with just a single male wage earner? Anybody? One. You know, and I, but if I go up the ladder to top executives, they all raise their head. They're not in touch with a changed world. Now, growing up, if you grew up in those families, <clears throat> they were preparing people to go into the big bureaucracies. When I worked as a consultant at and when it was Monopoly, all the managers, except maybe one or two, <coughs> were women, were men. And uh, to get to the top, you had to look exactly the same. They said, you, you will never get to the top if you don't wear a 42 long suit. <laughs> At, the Ford, at Ford, you had to be short, because Henry Ford was short. So these, but these men would move up by creating father-son relationships with the boss. Just like the family structure went into the work structure. Now today, kids growing up, generally, are in a world where their parents are at work, Early on, they're in daycare centers, they're with other kids, they have to develop much more interactive skills, much, and, and their emotional relationships are much more with their 
peers and kids, not so focused just on mom and dad. And when they get to, and uh, often the parents, when they come home at night, they're tired <laughs> and guilty, and the kids know it, and they know they can make the parents guilty, feel guilty. <laughs> Here, chuckles, but <laughs> the, uh, so they know they can, they can uh, learn how to negotiate whatever they want. <laughs> so when they get to work, they have the same attitude to the management. What are you doing for me? How are you going to help me? Very different from the past, where you want to just please the father or mother figure. Very different attitude. Relationships. And of course, young people coming in today to these knowledge organizations, often they, they're more familiar with the technology, with the new knowledge, than the people on, on the top. You know, when, when I spoke, it, one of my books came out in 2007, and at that time the, the primaries were on, the presidential primaries, and I was invited to speak at Google headquarters in California, Google Plus. And all of the candidates, from Republicans and Democrats, had come to speak to these because everybody wanted Google support. And I, I had a group of about 80 people I was talking to like this. And I said, who'd you like the best? They said, Obama. I said, why? Well, they said all the others talked about their experience and what they did and so on. But we know experience can be a negative. The world's changing. You know, just because Hillary Clinton did this and that, that has nothing to do with what we need in the future. But Obama talked about what we need is more research, what we need is more broadband for everybody, what we need is education, so on. He was laying out a vision for the future, that's what we need in our leadership today. Very different from another group that might have said, of old people who said, how are we going to keep all our wonderful values of the past? Yeah. Right? So, uh, <laughs> so we, we see a shift in work and what it demands, more collaboration, interaction, innovation, and we see a change in the people. <coughs> people like you who in many ways have different attitudes, values, skills than the, some of the people running things. <coughs> well, that calls for leadership that understands these differences. Now, I gave you a questionnaire that got at how much your values still fit the bureaucratic world versus how much they fit a much more interactive collaborative world. And I found of those who answered, 21 of you answered. 14 of you are much more in the interactive world. Two of you are still in the bureaucratic world. Would prefer a world that's much more um, clear roles. Leaders have the most experience. Organization values seniority. Like a job with autonomy. My goal at work is to meet the expectations set for me. I care more that the work we produce is excellent and that it satisfies the customer. Best boss is like a good father or mother. My goal at work is to be respected as an expert. And uh, five of you are kind of in the middle. Now the, the more interactive the majority of you agree more with I can benefit from continual change. I see myself as a free agent, not just loyal, but alert to good opportunities like a professional 
athlete. Um, I work at continually developing myself intellectually, emotionally, physically. I care more that a team member share a common purpose and that they all have the same values. I mean, interactive people say to me, yes, everybody's going to have different values. The question is, do we have the same purpose? Um, I'm continually developing my network. I like to work in a team where leadership shifts to the person with the appropriate skills. We call that a hierarchy rather than a hierarchy. I like interacting with people throughout the world on the internet. I prefer to be on a team where the leader is a facilitator rather than a boss. I use the internet regularly to find information about people and I can change my image to fit the situation. Mm -hmm. So these are very different, very different value attitudes and what we find in organizations, you get some extremely interactive, some more bureaucratic, and some who are struggling in between. They may have grown up in a more bureaucratic world and they feel the pull to change. And in managers, I, I, I wrote an article about how to manage these differences that you can all find on my webpage, which is just maccabee.com. You want to go there, there are a whole bunch of articles. One of them is how do you manage where you have this conflict, where you have a team, where I was with a company recently and we had this conflict. And the, <laughs> the, uh, the interactive, the interactive said, you know, we should be, we should be the one running things, because we know the technology better. And the bureaucratic said, yeah, you may know the new technology, you don't know the customer the way we do. You don't know other people in this organization, so you can't get, you can't call up the right person to get things done. You see that, the difference? Now, who's right? Who's right? Both of them. Both of them are right. So really, the job of leadership here is to use the abilities of both. But that really may mean organizational change. You have to change the organization to make use of both of these kinds of skills, not, not stick with a very bureaucratic organization. So, uh, you know, you cannot separate leadership from organization. You cannot separately separate leadership from context. Now, I just, just to finish, and then we'll have some questions. Um, the, those of you who read The Narcissistic Leader, how many of you have read Narcissistic Book? A lot of you did. Uh, but for those who didn't, there are four kinds of basic types of, of personality types that are described. And they come from Freud's, one of, a small article Freud wrote in 1930 on, <clears throat> on the healthy personality. He said, you know, I've written a lot about psychopathology, but, you know, a lot of, there are many people that are not sick, they're not neurotic, but they do have different personalities. And he found three different types that he had observed. He said even though they're mixed, everyone's a mix, you could say there are three basic types. And one is a caring type. These people's <clears throat> main values are helping others, caring for people. They're the kind of people who want jobs where they feel they're really helping others. And in this group, five of you are have that strongly. Have that as your dominant view. The second type he saw, he called the obsessive type. It's really the exacting type. The kind of person who is very disciplined, ordered, strong moral values. Uh, he said that these are the people who really you can count on, who are going to do the work, follow through, make sure it happens, and so on. So most of the, most of the great athletes are this 
type. Because if you think, I mean, somebody, as I put in the book, somebody once interviewed Tiger Woods, but I think Oprah. Oprah went, interviewed Tiger Woods. She said, what type of personality are you? He said, I'm anal. Well, that's his kind of person. So she said, what do you mean? He said, well, when my clothes come back from the laundry or cleaners, I've got to iron them, make sure there's no, absolutely no uh, wrinkles. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, but think about it. What other kind of personality can, at the end of the day, knock a little ball six feet into a hole 100 times before he goes home to dinner? Mm -hmm. What other kind of personality can stand and shoot 100 foul shots before they go home? Um, the best athletes have to have this quality. The ones who don't, they're very rare. There are a few who don't, like Babe Ruth, um, who are kind of geniuses. But, um, I mean, most athletes have to have this personality. The third type of personality he saw was, um, he called the narcissistic personality, right about it. I, in the positive sense, he called it visionary personality. He saw himself as this <coughs> kind of personality. He said, These, this is the kind of person who wants to change the world. They are the natural leaders who uh, are not satisfied with things as they are. They have a vision. They want things to be different. They constantly are trying to do that. And you can see that in some of our most great business leaders like Steve Jobs, his kind of personality. He wasn't just making a product. He wanted to change the world. He wanted to change Bill Gates. He wants to change them. He said, I want to change the way everyone works. That's not just producing a successful product. And uh, now each of these basic personalities has a positive development. You can develop the positive or it can fall into unproductive negative side. The helping person can become overly mothering, smothering. The, the uh, exacting person can become nitpicking and, and over controlling. The narcissistic person can become arrogant and out of touch, so on. But, there's a fourth type of personality that Eric Fromm, who I worked with, a psychoanalyst, a thinker, found. And, and he said this kind of personality is developing with the new modern market society. He called it the marketing personality. So this is a kind of personality that gets ahead by be, having a kind of a radar, knowing how to change the self and your viewpoints and your attitudes to fit, to meet um, what's the going market, personality market. You can, you recognize you need to talk one way with one group, another way with another group, et cetera. And the positive thing is this kind of person can be very flexible, very innovative, but the negative is they can be someone who, ha who is no center, no conviction, no sense of who they really are. Now, in terms of your group, so five of you came out strongly caring. Eight of you came out more exacting, which is a lot today. Very interesting, because we need exacting people. You often hard to find. Five of you came out as visionary, and four came out has more marketing, which I call adaptive in the positive sense. So you have the whole mix in this group. I could put you in, in, in groups together and ask you, give you a problem, and you'd come out with different results of what to do, or ask you what, what movie you most liked. To come out very different, each group. You could try it. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to uh, stop here and because we have a little time for questions. If you have any questions, I know we could go on indefinitely. Yeah. So, uh, do you think you, 
either you're naturally a leader or that you can become a leader? Do you think like people are naturally leaders or do you think they can become a Are people leader? natural leaders? Well, there are five personality traits that psychology shows are genetic, that we're born with. And those traits are, one is uh, curiosity, second is conscientiousness, following through, not giving up, third is resiliency rather than, you know, people who bounce back from defeat versus people who are much more hurt by it, shattered by it. Uh, the fourth is agreeableness versus suspiciousness. These are things you can see in babies and continue. <coughs> and the fifth is introversion versus extroversion. Now obviously someone who's born strong curiosity, agreeableness, conscientiousness, resiliency is going to be more likely to be a leader. But there's no, there's no guarantee. Nobody becomes a leader without training, experience, and so on. Everyone can improve. But some people have a better head start than others. I don't think introvert, extrovert, next extrovert. I find the strategic leaders tend to be more introverted, and the operational network leaders tend to be more extroverted. Let me, yeah. Uh, my question was, does every leader has narcissistic qualities? Does every leader have narcissistic qualities? No. I mean, we all have narcissistic qualities. <coughs> if we didn't, we wouldn't think we were any more important than anybody else. We would, I mean, it's a survival mechanism. But to have it the most dominant quality is the whole personality type. Now, for example, let's compare Obama and Romney. What type is Romney? Narcissistic. Hmm? I'd say he has an obsessive personality. I would say uh, erotic. 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 <laughs> right? Because he wants to be like, I mean, like yeah, he wants people to like him because he knows like the public was not like like him in the beginning. So he was just trying to yeah, change. Doesn't he have a marketing personality? Yeah. 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 Isn't he a person showing a personality of changing his opinions and yeah. values yeah. and so according to which group he's with? Right. Isn't he yeah. very clear? He's almost a poster boy right. for for a marketing personality. Yeah. And that wouldn't be bureaucratic so that he can keep the same values, the same old values. That, but, well you were saying that um um, I guess the um, something about the bureaucratic personalities, how they want to keep the same old values. Like when you were saying, people were raised with just a father um, being yeah. a single household. Well, they, 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 they feel comfortable fitting in that kind of struct, organizational structure. Mm -hmm. But they could be helpers. They could be helpers within it. They could be uh, marketing within it. They could be exacting within it. Um, and what about Obama? What kind of personality does he have? Narcissistic. Nar he's, a, he's a typical narcissistic leader. Our greatest visionary presidents have all been narcissistic leaders. And they all have the same uh, psychological pattern from childhood. And that is a weak or absent father and a strong mother. So you see that with Abraham Lincoln. He hated his father. <laughs> wouldn't even go to his funeral. Strong stepmother who really helped him and supported him. Franklin Roosevelt's father died when he was little. Ronald Reagan's father was an alcoholic. She sales from a strong mother. Bill Clinton's father died before his born. Strong mother relationship. And Barack Obama's father left him. Strong mother. So what why is why what is what happens? What happens is for little boys, and it's true for girls in a different way. They don't have a father figure to identify with, so they don't internalize all those values, which you see strongly in the exacting personality. They don't have a strong sense of right and wrong from the father. They have to create their own 
have to create their own sense of meaning, their own identity. And if you ever read Obama's autobiography, any of you read it? He struggles to develop his identity. Who am I? Am I black or white? What do I stand for? Who am I with? What am I trying to create? It's a struggle, which you see in all the figures like this. They take a long time, often, to develop their sense of self and vision. Now, they can be evil, like a Hitler or Mao. They can develop an evil vision. Stalin did the same kind of you can see the same kind of dynamic, family dynamic. Yeah. Okay, how did you decide to um, not necessarily change the meaning, but it's normally narcissistic has a negative connotation, but you just changed it to make it not so negative. What made you decide to do that? Because I, people are so brainwashed to think of narcissistic in a negative sense, mm -hmm. which Freud didn't necessarily. <clears throat> so I felt, you know, to get over the negative thing, to call it by its productive side. It's a garbage, the, the concept of garbage can for all kinds of egoism and selfishness and so on. But every type can be egoistic. Every type can be selfish. So people lose the sense of the narcissistic personality as the visionary, for good or evil. I mean, the, the visions can be unrelated to reality, or they can be visions like a Steve Jobs of a new new kind of computer. Okay. Yeah? Um, when it comes to, I know you said that a lot of narcissistic computers, or a lot of people who develop, or men who develop their, um, their own identity, it's because they did not have fathers in the home. Now, what about women? Yeah, the women, the women who I've talked with, people like Oprah, um, they have the opposite. They have a mother who they can't, don't identify with, maybe because she's housewife. They don't want to be, they don't want to be stuck. They don't want that life. And then they say, I can't identify with my father. I'm not a man. So I've got to find my own self, my own sense of self. Yeah. So do you think the narcissistic uh, personality is the one that is more uh, capable of bringing a change, like a radical change, either for the good side and for the bad side? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, it, it's the only type who, has, who ha has a strong drive to change, natural drive. Now, other types can do it. They can do it by working with processes and so on. Sam Palmasano of IBM, who was the CEO up to just recently, he changed IBM. And he's not a narcissist. Much more of an adaptive, productive, adaptive personality. But he got everyone involved in IBM in creating the values. He had a, called it a jam around the world. Everybody sent in their views. So he created a process, a, a really powerful, collaborative process of a whole huge organization to change. So you don't have to be a narcissist. Yeah. Um, like you explained for the narcissistic leaders. Give speak more or less. <coughs> that they are absent, uh, their father has been absent in their life. Does it necessarily have to be in this way in order to be a narcissistic leader? Does that have to be the case? That the father's absent? No, it could be the case the father's there, but the boy does not is, doesn't admire him, like Ronald Reagan. I mean, hmm? could it not be like? Does it? I mean, what I'm trying to say is, the relationship between the boy and the father has to be bad in order to become a narcissistic leadership. Is it like a necessary <coughs> thing? If it's very close, and you identify with the father. You could become a, you can become arrogant. You can become, become egocentric, but you're not going to be a narcissistic leader. You, you don't develop your own sense of right and wrong and good and evil to start with. You have it programmed mm -hmm. early on. Yeah. Uh, can you like change your personality type? Uh, like uh, meanwhile, like uh, I don't know. After something happened in your life, like a major event. 
and then this thing just changes the way you are, and then it becomes something else, like another personality? <coughs> well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, that, a lot of people raise that. Generally, no. You can make your personality more productive. You can really work on it. So it's, a, it's almost unrecognizable. I'm somebody who, and you see that in people who have gone, become gamblers or alcoholics who, who change. But they, they, their basic personality doesn't change, just change from unproductive to productive. Um, people find religion, become twice born. Um, there's a lot of change in their personality, but the type generally doesn't change, it, it just becomes more developed. Do you think Obama will be a better leader the second term? Will he be a better leader in the second term? I certainly hope so. I think he's learned he's learned a very basic point of his weakness as a leader. I mean, I, I think one of his major weaknesses as a leader is that he had the view that if he said something once, everyone would understand it. I mean, that's why he needed Bill Clinton to come in and explain things. He's got to look. If he's going to be a better leader, he's got to explain more. He's got to get out more and explain, not just make inspirational speeches, but explain why. Why are we doing this? Why is it important? So, going to get people with him. But he's used to being a professor where he just makes a lecture and gives you a test. Can't do that, does he? Better themselves and to become what? better, or someone that wants to better themselves to become a, a, a more challenging leader, what would they need to do in order to become more productive? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> you want me to tell you that in a few words? We can stay. <laughs> <laughs> well, to become a better leader, you, I would think first of all, you have to understand your context. What are really the challenges? And who are you trying to lead? You're not a leader in the abstract. So who are you? What are your values? What's your philosophy? Most people never make clear their own philosophy of life. What's your purpose in life? What are the values that drive you? How do you look at results? How do you make moral decisions? And who are the people you want to lead? I mean, if it's this class, it's a very, very diverse class. And I'm not just, I'm not just talking about, about sex or race. I'm talking about personality, values. How are you going to understand these people? Now, there are ways to work on all this, but it's work. Coming a leader is like, any kind of, you talk about an art, it's an art. An art takes, <coughs> a book was written about the best people in any art, and they say they've spent at least 10,000 hours practicing. Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Any of you read that book? Yeah, Excellent book. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much. You're